Today's lecture is about the Aboriginal Australians, the first peoples of Australia. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with the plight of the Aborigines, this lecture will be perhaps eye-opening for you. And for those of you who are familiar with the plight of the Aborigines, for those of you who live in Australia and have grown up uh, perhaps with some access to Aboriginal culture. Hopefully there'll be some unique and interesting things that you'll learn here as well today. I was just talking with a gentleman who has spent some time with the Aborigines and traveled over much of Australia. And one of the things that I was commenting is that many people in Australia, 24 to 25 million people, have lived their entire lives without ever really having a conversation with an Aboriginal person. And not only not just having a conversation, many people have never even met or had even the slightest of dealings with an Aboriginal person. And so imagine now living in a country, having such extreme opinions, and there are extreme opinions in Australia about, uh, about the Aborigines and, and their, their plight and their role, in the same way that we still have conversations in the United States about Native Americans and African Americans. And this, when you put these issues together, the Aborigines faced really what would be a combination of what our Native Americans and African Americans would face. The same levels of bias, the same levels of intrusion, and racism as well. And all of these play a role. So today, we're going to talk about the Aboriginal Australians, these first peoples in Australia and their fight for freedom. It's important to recognize that these people, the Aboriginal Australians, have been on the continent for anywhere from 40 to 50,000 years, and some people say as much as 65,000 years. The first Aborigines came across from the top of New Guinea in a single population so when we think about this as multiple migrations, that may be true. However, most people now believe that there was one large group of Aborigines that came across, passed through the Torres Strait from what was now New Guinea. And at the time that they crossed, this was known as, well, 50,000 years ago, this was known as a single continent, the continent of Sahul. And so after the last ice age, the rising seas rushed in and filled in all of this area that was once a land bridge. And so part of what was now open, open before now, was closed off and surrounded by water. So the first Aboriginal Australians appeared to have arrived during a period of glaciation when the land was all connected. There was an ice sheet that passed over this, so they were able to cross over the top. However, there were still some areas of open sea, and consequently it made them among the earliest of the world's seafaring people. They developed a hunter-gatherer style, and this is really important for us to consider because many other cultures later on would be developing agriculture, and the Aborigines did not do this. It's estimated that when the Europeans first arrived in the 1700s, that there were 350,000 to 750,000 Aborigines living in Australia. So how do they populate? This is the interesting question. And here we can see a little bit of a map about how that shows how they populated the land. We can see that when they came down through New Guinea, you can see here now all that that's brown up in there is still the land mass. So they were able to come down and populate this area. And the first ones, they went along the west coast first, and then they went along the east coast. They knew enough not to go through the center because they could tell from the outer edges that this was going to be a dry desert center. So instead, they went along the edges of the continent, staying away from the forbidding center. And these areas in the center still remain sparsely populated even today. Incredibly, they populated this entire continent, which is almost the same size as the United States of America, 
they populated this entire region in as little as 1,500 years. So consider that these people moved, found a place to live, built their homes, continued to move on and move on and move on, and they were able to create fixed populations, independent, isolated populations, rarely interacting with each other in a period of over 1,500 years. And what's even more remarkable is that this pattern has held for 50,000 years. Some of these people are still in the exact same places they were when they arrived on the continent 45 to 65,000 years ago. As I mentioned, unlike ancient populations in Africa, Mesopotamia, and Asia, the indigenous Australians did not, and it transformed the rainforest into savanna. This is very, very important because not only were the aboriginals caretakers of the land, but they also were responsible over this 50,000 year period for largely transforming the land. So the center of the country was very much a desert, but around some of the areas, the coastal areas, we can see that because of this fire stick farming, they were able to change the makeup of this land. And they burned vegetation to promote the growth of bush potatoes and edible ground plants. So they didn't farm them, but they knew that if they were able to burn away some of the other weeds and other uh, plants, that these other plants, the potatoes and, the, and the, the bush potatoes and the edible ground plants would grow back. It also helped with hunting. They knew that when they could start a fire, on one side it would push the animals out on the other, almost like a fire drive. And it changed the composition and plant, uh, plant and animal life in that area. So when you burn, new plants come up, and then what ends up happening is the type of animals that come back there are also changed, because now you're attracting the type of animals that eat the same foods that they do, which was often the larger animals. It also was meant as a form of weed control, it was meant to increase biodiversity, and it reduced the risk of major devastating fires. Think about that for a second and what's happening in Australia. That they're now bringing some of these methods back and, and helping people understand that fire stick farming had the long-term effect of turning dry forest into savanna. It also helped produce uh, and, and reproduce more uh, animals like the kangaroo. But it also made sure that there was not as, much large, not as many large fires. So when you burn off on a regular basis all of that undergrowth, what you find is that there isn't as much tinder to start these large fires that have swept across Australia. And so now there's talk about giving some of this control of some of these areas back to some of these indigenous groups and starting to employ some of these methods again for maintaining this bush area for maintaining the dry savannas and burning them on a regular basis so that they don't have these incredible devastating fires that devastate the country. There are over 250 unique nations and languages. So let's consider for a second that this is a country the size of the United States approximately. And now imagine 250 distinct nations inside. We tend to overlook that and we think, okay, it's a tribe, right? But these are tribes that see themselves as distinctive nations. And we'll see this also again, and I, I don't always like to draw these kinds of reference, but it's a, it's a unique and interesting reference. When you go through the United States, you'll find, for example, in Wisconsin alone where I'm from, you have the Menominee Nation, you have the Ho-Chunk Nation. These are different tribes that have set up and they have their own nations. In the same way, this is what we see, this pattern, this quilt work across Australia with these 250 individual nations with clans underneath them from as few as five or six to as many as 30, 40, 30 or 40. So each nation had its own language and some of them had a few or multiple languages. And there are more than 250 indigenous Australian languages, including 800 dialects. So it even fights with the islands of the South Pacific when you get into Micronesia, and there you have almost 1,800 distinctive languages among these island groups. There you can understand, right? Because they're separated by landmass, they're separated by water. 
But here, this is all the same continent, these people living right next door to each other, but developing different languages. And why would that happen? They developed different languages because they had different stories to tell. And they lived in different places. Their light lake might be different from a lake, might be slightly smaller, might be slightly darker, might be slightly clearer. And so the words that they created were specific to their area. And so the way that they spoke and the way that they communicated with each other was unique. And we've seen this across the world, but even within the United States, think about how sometimes it might be difficult for someone from New Jersey to talk with someone from New Orleans. They're from the same country, and yet you put those two people in a room together, and they'll both look at each other, shaking their heads, thinking, where the hell did you learn your English? Right? And this is the same thing that happens among these tribes. They can come across and talk to each other, and yet the words that they use, the dialect that they use, and the way that they speak and express themselves can be fundamentally different. Today, only 13 traditional languages are still taught to children, which in my estimation is actually quite good. Uh, comparatively, that they've taken some of these more uh, uh, widely spoken languages and now teach 13 of these dialects and languages to children. Approximately another 100 of these Aboriginal languages still exist today. However, many of the wise men, many of the tribal elders that are dying, they're in their 70s and 80s and 90s, they're the last speakers of these languages. And so now we're recording almost on an annual basis the death of one or more languages of these ancient Aboriginal languages in Australia. And there won't be any return. And, and some people say, you know, this is, this is so bad. And yet this is the way of the world. This is the way when people come together and are subjugated and conquered and their languages go away because they're no longer able to tell their stories in their native languages. There are two distinct groups when we're talking about Aboriginal Australians. And it's important to recognize these groups, particularly for those of you who are gonna continue on and travel up the eastern coast of Australia, you'll recognize that there are two distinct groups. The first is the Aboriginal peoples. These are the people who were already on mainland Australia when the British began colonizing in 1788. And then the second group is the Torres Strait Islander people. Now these are the people who live in the islands on the northern, above the Northern Territory in Australia. And this is part of modern day Queensland, Australia. They consider themselves a separate group. They have a separate history. And so if you're interested in learning about the differences between these two groups, you certainly may, you can discover the, the difference between Aboriginal Australians and the Torres Strait Islander people. The Europeans arrived in 1606, perhaps a little bit earlier where the Asians were there. But we know that the uh, first known landing in Australia by Europeans, by, by Dutch navigator Willem Janszoon in 1606. 29 other Dutch expeditions did come to the country and they dubbed the continent New Holland. Other explorers came later. Captain James Cook, uh, Cook arrived in 1770 on Possession Island. And he claimed this territory for the British crown without meeting, negotiating, or even speaking with the existing inhabitants. Before the departure, the president of the Royal Society, one of the voyage sponsors, wrote, and I quote, the people of any lands he might discover were the natural and in the strictest sense of the word, the legal possessors of the regions they inhabit. No European nation has a right to occupy any part of their country or settle among them without their voluntary consent. Conquest over such people can give no just title because they could never be the aggressors. The first governor, Arthur Phillip, was instructed explicitly to build good relations, friendly relations with the people, the native peoples of Australia. They wanted to ensure that their arrival and their colonization there would be friendly, not hostile. So when the British arrived, they estimate that there was a population of around 750,000 Aborigines. But soon thereafter, because the Aborigine people were not used to these diseases that they came with, they had absolutely no defense system built, 
whether it's a physical defense, defense system or an immunodeficiency, an immuno system, they were simply unable to fight against the arrival of the British. Some Aborigines did resist when the British came. In fact, 20,000 Aborigines were killed in violent conflicts in the early days. However, the British did not need to resort to massacres to eliminate most of these people. Most people simply died from exposure to the many diseases that the British brought with them. And in time, when they were thrown off of their land, they died from impoverishment by having their land seized. Early European uh, observers said that these people lived an arduous and miserable lifestyle. And so it begs the question, why would you want to move to a land where the people who have lived there for so long are obviously miserable, right? And so we question why would they have written such a thing? And yet James Cook, I believe, wrote probably a more apt description. He said that, in fact, when I walk among these people, they seem, in fact, far happier than most Europeans. And this is true. They settled this area and had everything that they needed. They were safe, they were protected, and they said that these people suffered less and enjoyed life more than the majority of civilized men. Historian Jeffrey Blaney wrote that the material standards for most Aborigines at the time that they arrived surpassed that of people living in Europe at the time. So imagine now, these savages, that they called them, had a better standard of living, had better meals, regular meals, certainly far warmer weather, right, than most of the people in Europe. They were able to live comfortably, live out on the land. They knew their land implicitly. And so they were able to live far richer lives than most people in Europe at the time of discovery. The Hawkesbury and Nepean Wars from 1790 to 1816 were largely fought in the Sydney area and were the first conflict between settlers and Aboriginal Australians. According to the historian Jeffrey Blaney again, in a thousand different places there were shootings, but again, the majority of these people died from exposure to smallpox, to measles, influenza, and other news diseases that swept from one camp to another. So the main conqueror of these Aborigines was disease, and its constant ally, demoralization. Imagine having all of your friends and family living peacefully in your own land, having enough food, always enough fish, sufficient water, and then people come, and you think that if you keep a far enough distance from them that you're going to be safe. But as we're learning today, with the viruses that are sweeping across our planet today even, that these people had absolutely no defense. So distance didn't keep them away, didn't keep them safe. That somehow these diseases managed to find their way and decimated these early peoples. So the wars that were fought used mostly guerrilla warfare tactics. However, they also engaged in some conventional battles. The wars revealed, uh, uh, resulted in the defeat of these two tribes and their lands were taken by the British. And this is what happened. So the British would come in and would seize a certain amount of lands and if the Aborigines fought back and they lost the war, they would lose all of their lands. And so they had to consider whether or not they really wanted to fight to preserve all of their lands or whether or not they wanted to retain the little lands that they had left. They said that there was an epic, that there was a, some diseases that uh, befell these people uh, on accident, but there was a smallpox epidemic that was recorded near Sydney in 1789 that wiped out half of the population. Imagine losing half of an entire population in one year period. Some argue that the smallpox came from Indonesian fishermen in the far north, which would be very unique because these, again, these people were largely untouched as well. And most historians today argue that it was brought on purpose by the colonists in the same way that across the United States we brought blankets infected with smallpox to decimate the native communities 
the First Nations of the United States and Canada. In the same way, the outbreak of small, smallpox was a deliberate act that when they could no longer fight on all of these battlefronts, they simply started to introduce these types of diseases to these people and wiped them out well in advance so that they were able to continue to proceed out from Sydney without having any, inter any interference from the native peoples. Smallpox sp spread well beyond the limits of European settlement, including much of southeastern Australia. And it's said that during this period of time, it killed 40 to 60% of the Aboriginal population across the country. In turn, other diseases started to follow. We had measles, typhus, cholera, and even the common cold. So we think about the common cold. Most of us are able to defend ourselves just through rest. But now imagine a people who had never had any access at all to this common cold. It killed them almost as quickly as smallpox did. Without an ancestral history of coping with these pathogens, the pathogens simply took over and spread across, and the Aborigines were able to do nothing except stand and watch their people die in plague after plague. So the impact of early Europeans was profoundly disruptive to Aboriginal life. And some settlers were actually aware that what they were doing was stealing the land. Most people simply came, and because of their ethnocentric view, that British Britain was the center of the world at the time, they simply said, any land that we land on must be ours, because we are the center of all things. But these people didn't see it that way. And some of the people actually recognized that they were not the rightful owners of this land. One person, Charles Griffiths, a settler, said, the question comes to this, which has the better right? The savage, born in a country which he runs over but can scarcely be said to occupy, or the civilized man who comes to introduce into this unproductive country the industry which supports life. So even among those, and these are interesting arguments, aren't they? We hear, them, we hear it even today in the back of our minds. We know that it's wrong, but yet something about it says, well, that guy gave up his entire life to come here and to start over. Couldn't they share this land? And that really is the intriguing question of whether or not they could have shared the land. But the combined effects of disease, disposition, intermarriage, and conflict saw a, con saw a complete collapse of the po Aboriginal population of Tasmania from a few thousand people to within a few hundred by the, 19, by the 1830s. From the 1830s, colonial governments established offices to help protect the Aborigines, but the policies, as you see here, were conducted, indigenous peoples, and conduct government policy toward them. That's an important word, because government policy should be, should, should be for them, or for their benefit. But this was government policy towards them, and that's very specific. They believed that what they were doing was rescuing these people from the hell in which they lived, and so they wanted to carry out welfare and assimilation programs. The missionaries came in to remove them from their homes and to establish for them a new life that was more akin to the life in Britain. Permanent European settlers came to control most of the continent by the end of the 19th century. This is a picture of a group, the Pintupi, who were not really contacted until 1984. That's really recent, isn't it? 1984, and so these people were also followed the similar pattern of uh, introduction to society. They were moved from their lands, but this is a picture of these, the, of these people when they were uh, on their move to a new place. The decimation of Aboriginal Australians arrived through land grabs, largely. Disease cleared large tracts of land in advance of the European rival, so they would send people with diseases out to meet these people. The disease would spread, and by the time that the Europeans arrived, most of the Aborigines had been dead, uh, so they were simply able to walk onto the land and to settle it. Uh, London-based planners thought that Australia seemed like an easy spot to colonize, so shortly thereafter, after their arrival, they started to ship convicts there to colonize the land. Australia's land is deceptively fertile. It seems 
very, very fertile, but its fertility is simply because it had tens of millions of years to gather nutrients, but there's no upheaval in the ground through volcanic processes like we have in much of the world that continues to regenerate these nutrients. So they were able to st basically stockpile and have great success in early farming, but they realized that later on they were unable to sustain all of this farming long-term because they would simply deplete the soil of all of the nutrients. The children of the first Aborigines uh, who survived the first epidemic had, epidemic had low population density, again, because of their hunter-gatherer lifestyle and partly because of the plagues. None of these nomads were able to compete with the British and the other colonizers who would come. So countless people fled their lands. Others of them were shot on sight when the colonists arrived and simply wanted their land and others were shot and killed because they were stealing sheep or stealing crops. They had no concept, imagine now, that people are coming to their lands and bringing sheep and farming crops. For them, this land had always been hunter-gatherer, so if they saw an animal, they simply killed it when they needed to eat it. And this, of course, flew in the face of the British who had brought these animals for their own well-being. So the different understandings of of property rights can help explain how these ranchers slaughtered many of these early neighbors. So they complained about these aboriginal hunters hunting their sheep, and so they tried to understand it, but they couldn't. They couldn't convince these aborigines of their ways. And so the only way, really, was to kill them, to eliminate them. And so the government decided to let one problem solve the other and let these people basically just go at each other. And so in 1833, the Noongar tribe rose in revolt against the colonists, and they mostly li limited their resistance to spearing sheep. So to show them that they were the people, the owners of the land, they went out and they speared the sheep of the colonists. And this was met with a great response from the British. The government placed a 30-pound bounty on the elder named Yagan, and his head was soon sent on its way to the London Museum where it remained until 1997. The bounty method turned out to be very popular and affected, and this is a little bit difficult to hear. In the early 1830s, governments collected offered bounties of five, five pounds per Aboriginal adult and two pounds per child. In the middle of the decade, it was, middle, it was open season on the Aboriginal people. So they had risen up in revolt, and now, to eliminate them completely, they placed bounties on their heads. In one single day, over 5,000 people formed a human chain and started to walk through the bush to push people out of the bush and killing them in what would be a drive hunting expedition. And these people collected the bounties, brought the heads of these people in, collected the money, and then used this money to continue to bring in goods back from London to continue their, their development and their colonization. This also led later on to a shift in the government they recognized that the way that they were treating these people was completely inappropriate and was not right. And so there became a radical shift with the incoming Whig Party. So these people wanted to abolish slavery and limit the, outage, the other outrages in the colonies. And so what they did was they started to change the policies of open-air murder in Australia. But in response... What ended up happening is that the government there needed to make an example, so they found some white settlers who had killed some Aborigines. They charged them, and they were actually hanged as well. Some of them were sentenced to hang, but it was just really a token case of Aborigines getting some level of justice among the white colonists. But the colonists themselves understood that the only way that they could survive is if they were to eliminate the Aboriginal way of life. So in the past, Aborigines could come and glow, go as they pleased, but at the risk of being shot on sight if they stepped out of line. Under the new laws, 
Aborigines were given a new legal status, but this legal status was very much like that of children. They were given specific identification. They were only allowed to be in certain geographic areas, and they had to receive permits for travel. In addition, they would need to receive consent from the government for a marriage, a job assignment, or to receive a housing assignment. And the government also assigned missionaries to Christianize them. At the same time, and we call this the forgotten generations, thousands of Aboriginal children were pulled from their homes and were sent to orphanages or given to white families to re-educate and to realign these children with the British way of life. And there were severe punishments for speaking their native languages. The children had to dress, eat, live, and work like white children, and there was a physical punishment that was attached for them if they did not do so or if they reverted back to their native ways in any manner. On top of the official abuse, there was also a great deal of unreported abuse, sexual abuse, because these children were simply lost. There was no one to look out for their well-being. They were sent to orphanages and then basically assigned to people. These children and their generations were known as the stolen generations. Between 10 and 33% of Aboriginal Australian children were forcibly removed from their homes and placed with white families. They were put in adoptive institutions and forbidden from speaking their native languages. Their name was often changed. I want to draw your attention to this photo because some folks underplay the stolen generations. And I'd like for you to see very specifically, this is a handwritten note here. It says, I like the little girl in the center. She clearly looks the whitest. But if taken by anyone else, any of the others will do as long as they are strong. And this was a woman wanting to adopt a child, one of those Aboriginal children. Now, how many of you, if you were looking to adopt a child, unless you were working on a farm or planning to put those children to work, would say that any of them will do as long as they're strong? There's a clear implication here that these children were pulled out of their homes, pulled out of their loving families, and placed in work camps effectively, placed in families that put them to work so that they could earn their keep. And this is what's most disgusting about this, that an entire generation of people was pulled out and effectively treated as indentured slave labor. At least 100,000 children were removed and placed in state-run orphanages or in homes. And this practice ended in the mid-1950s, but it continues to haunt these people because it impacts them today. There's a whole generation or two generations of people who were products of this. And some of them are happy. Some of them are very well-adjusted people. But there are those who are not so well-adjusted, who have been damaged. And of course, the damage that comes from a society when you lose a generation. How do you teach your son? How do you teach your daughter all of those things, the traditions and the dreamings and the song lines? How do you teach those to them to pass it on to the next generation? And that has largely been lost. The Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission argued that these removals constituted attempted genocide and had a major impact on the indigenous population. And a few historians do claim that these, uh, say that these claims are exaggerated. And this is what's known as the history wars in Australia. This idea that we have two different histories that are being told. Who gets to tell that history? Well, Aborigines should be able to tell their history. And the white folks should be able to tell their history. And ideally, at some point, they'll be able to work together and come to a recognition that they have a shared history and that they're complicit in their history, in their success, or in their failure. On February 13, 2008, Kevin Rudd, the Prime Minister of Australia, apologized to Indigenous Australians for the stolen generation. And he said... I guess this is in the next line. But he said, basically, I apologize for having stolen, for, on behalf of my country, for having taken you from your homes, for having stolen much of your lives, and for having stolen your history. The right to vote would come later. The first version of the Australian Constitution excluded Aboriginal 
people from representation and specifically deprived them of the vote. They didn't get the right to vote until 1962. This is a significant piece to consider. They remained non-citizens regulated by the Flora and Fauna Act. Can you imagine a greater injustice than to call people animals under the Flora and Fauna Act? Human beings aren't governed under a Flora or Fauna Act. Only animals and plants are. And so only in 1967 did they vote that Australian would Australians vote that federal laws would also apply to Aboriginal Australians. So there was a completely different set of laws for Aborigines until 1967. Most Aboriginal Australians did not have full voting, full citizenship, or voting rights until 1965. Things in Australia continue to move forward, but they are still far from fair. Aboriginal artifacts and, and uh, items still continue to be held in London by the Crown. They have not been returned to the Aboriginal people. In many areas, deceased native properties still go into receivership instead of being passed along to the next of kin. Imagine your property that you've owned for generations being taken to a court for the court to determine who owns it instead of it being passed down to your son or your daughter. Though in 2012, the Australian government admitted that it was considering changing the law. With a virtually annihilated culture and history, and with extremely tenuous property and voting rights, what ended up happening is that these Aboriginal communities are now rife with alcoholism and drug abuse. Much like many native first communities, they have no way of dealing with alcohol or drugs, and so it has continued to ravage, and they live like they are in ghettos. The struggle continues for Australians today. They seek restitution. They'd like to be able to have sovereignty and include compensation for much of their land that has been taken from them. But Australia has never made a treaty, making it one of the only nations in the world to have never formed a treaty with its First Nation peoples. Today, Aborigines are about 3.3% of a 24 million population. They continue to have a much younger age profile. More than half of the Aboriginal pro people are under the age of 25. This is what gives the people of Aboriginal Australia a great deal of hope, that there's a next younger generation who wants more and wants to have greater impact on the country. The majority, 79%, live in cities or non-remote areas. Only a very small portion, 7% live in remote areas, and 14% live in extremely remote areas. So 21% of the population lives remote. Over one-third of indigenous Australians live in major cities, but they face substantial levels of disadvantage. They face many challenges today. Inequality, they've lost their land, and they're not being heard in decision-making processes that affect and impact their lives. They're lagging in key indicators of development, children's literacy, employment, life expectancy. 20% of four, to five, four and five-year-olds do not attend preschool. 38% of students do not complete high school. 43% of year four students fall below the benchmark for reading. And 59% of the Australian youth detention population is indigenous. These are very similar numbers to the plight that's happened in the United States with the African American community. And we're seeing the same things happening here. Life expectancy in a country that has very high life expectancy, almost half of Aboriginal men and a third of Aboriginal women die before they turn 45. At all ages, Aboriginal life expectancy is far lower than for non-Aboriginal Australians. The median age of death for Aboriginal Australians is 53 years old. That's 25 years earlier than the average non-Aboriginal or white person in Australia. And I don't even just say white people, we say non-Aboriginal, Indians, Chinese, whoever that race is, they have a full 25 years more of a life expectancy than Aborigines in Australia. So why do they live shorter lives? Poverty for one, poor health and nutrition, poor housing, dispossession of their tribal lands. They no longer have an anchor to live. 
low education levels, high unemployment, and racism. The idea of this pervasive racism continues to eat at the fabric of this society. Incarceration and suicide are very high. Aboriginal Australians comprise 26% of the nation's jail population, and they're only 3.3% of the total population of the country. All right? So 24 million people and Aborigines at 3.3% comprise 26%. 59% of their juveniles are in detention. Aboriginal Australian teen suicide rates are among the highest in the world. But what can be done? We all know that self-determination is the key. Since Europeans arrived, they have been marginalized and they have been forcefully decimated and thrown from their lands. Encouraging signs from government are that they may be willing to give these Aboriginal peoples a voice in their future. Australian Prime Minister Paul Keating said, it begins, I think, with the act of recognition. Recognition that it was we who did the dispossessing. Recognition is the first step of the truth and recon reconciliation process. We're hoping that there will be open communication and that someday there will be grounds for all people of Australia to live and to have equal chances at success and happiness. So the next step for Australia, and I guess for the world really, is to recognize that there's unfinished business and we ask what we can do to facilitate justice for these people. And I'd like to close today with a quote. We are all visitors to this place, to this time and to this place. We are just passing through. Our purpose here is to observe, to learn, to grow, to love, and then we return home. And with that, good people, I'm going home. Thank you all very much. It's been lovely meeting you all. Thank you for coming today.